A basic dilemma that a researcher in the social sciences will be confronted with when designing their research is whether to prioritize breadth or depth. Choosing breadth means that you should cover a large population and reach some conclusions about it that, while not necessarily true of each individual member, will hold true of the population in general. Your aim in doing so is to see the big picture of how things are in society without getting hung up on the minutiae and the exceptions. Going for depth means that you would like to have a closer look at the individual people and smaller groups and organizations in order to understand the nuances. Not just what is happening, but how exactly does it happen, why is it happening, how do people perceive and respond to it, how is it affecting different aspects of their lives, and so on. Depth versus breadth is not exactly a binary opposition, but it is something of a continuum. You can only have so much depth in a study with broad coverage, and you can only cover so much breadth in a study with a deeper interpretive focus. For example, a survey methodology potentially allows you to cover very large populations, but it does not lend itself particularly well to studying the details of each respondent's actions and perspective. A meta-analysis, by combining several studies, gives you even more breadth by making it possible to combine data from several populations, or the same population over a period of time, or studied under different conditions, but that comes at the expense of deeper understanding the details of each individual study. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, is the case study methodology, which we will discuss in this video. In a case study, the focus is deliberately narrowed down to have a closer look at a particular subset of a broader population. There are many definitions of case studies, some of which contradict and challenge one another. One definition that I think encapsulates this approach well has been proposed by linguist David Noonan, who defined the case study as a methodology whereby the researcher selects an instance from the class of objects and phenomena one is investigating, and investigates the way this instance functions in a context. Let's unpack what this means. First of all, any case study needs a case, a specific example that represents a class of phenomena. This case may be a person, for example, a specific learner of English as a second language, an activity, such as a course utilizing project-based learning methods, an artifact, for instance, a digital learning game about research methods, an organization, a community, etc. The important thing here is that a case should be a bounded unit. This means that it can be separated from other instances in terms of time, space, and activities that people engage in. To illustrate, you could do a case study where the case is a gamified quiz used for student assessment in a political science course at a particular university. But if you define your case as gamification of course assessment in higher education, that would probably be too broad, because there are many different types and use scenarios for gamification, and they are applied differently. This would instead be a good starting point for a survey. Another important element of Noonan's definition is that a case study examines the case in its real-life context, considering relevant contextual variables such as history, cultural aspects, political and economic factors, and so on. So, if you were doing a case study of how course gamification is used and received by students at such and such university, in such and such country, you would also have to examine how it fits into the broader teaching practices at that university, what are the social norms and mutual expectations dictating how lecturers interact with their students, what learning styles are commonly taught and adopted in secondary education, and how they shape university students' approaches to learning, Basically, you would need to not only describe your case, but also analyze why it is this way, and how it connects to other relevant practices. This leads me to the third feature of case studies, the one I actually started the video from. Case studies provide an in-depth account of a phenomenon. They tend to offer what is called a thick description, which means that they describe not just what people do, but how people think about what they do, and why they do it this way. A good case study will often highlight tensions and contradictions, because people are not always logical or consistent, and no population is homogeneous. 
Maybe most of the students in your gamified classroom enjoyed the experience, but there were one or two who absolutely hated it. This would be a good starting point to figure out what happened there. Maybe they don't like competing against fellow students. Or maybe they felt like the time was too limited and there was a lot of pressure. Or maybe these students happen to come from a different educational background and have different expectations as to what classroom activities should look like. Establishing this and trying to improve the experience for these students could be the real focus of your case study. These are the kind of things that tend to get lost a bit in studies that focus on breadth over depth. And that's what makes case studies a useful counterpart to surveys and experimental research. There are many different ways of carrying out case studies and many different types, indeed many different typologies of them. For example, educational psychologist Robert Stake distinguishes two fundamental kinds of case studies. The first is the intrinsic case study, where the researcher is driven mainly by interest toward the specific case itself. For example, there's a university in the United States that has a student-run publishing house, which works on actual commercial book publishing and offers students an opportunity to hone their skills in a real-life setting before they finish their studies. This could be the focus of a case study on experiential learning because it happens to be a rather unique case that could contribute unique insights to the conversation about university learning. It can, however, be quite tricky to publish a case study like that that just describes an interesting case because in academia, there is often an expectation that research should contribute to a deeper theoretical understanding of how things work. This is what the instrumental case study is about. In such a study, the case is more of a tool, a means to an end, where the ultimate objective is to develop a theory, or to test and improve an existing one, or to get to understand a class of phenomena better. For example, you could be conducting a case study on how language immersion is being used to teach the Japanese language at a university in Belarus. This may be a very specific case, but it also is representative of a larger set of cases. Creating language immersion, where students don't rely on their mother tongue, while teaching a foreign language to a mostly mono-ethnic group that also has very limited exposure to that foreign language outside of the classroom. Thus, a case study with this kind of focus could aim to contribute to a deeper understanding of the challenges of language immersion, or even to seek to redefine what language immersion is, and so on. The actual case is not as important here as its theoretical implications. Stake also describes the third category of case studies, the collective case study. If you see other sources describe a multiple case study, that is a similar concept. The idea is that you combine several cases in order to understand the broader picture, potentially at the expense of depth, by synthesizing or comparing them. Most often these are instrumental case studies. Let's say you are studying computer science courses in middle schools in Namibia. This may seem like a specific enough context, but there may exist vast differences between schools in major cities such as Winook and remote rural areas where access to technology may be more limited. By conducting a case study in both of these locales and examining the results together, you may be able to get a more holistic picture while also understanding the specificity of each case. As a research methodology, the case study does not depend on any single data source or data collection method. It can accommodate various sources of data, including those obtained directly from people, for example, focus group discussions, interviews, observation, including participant observation, questionnaires, and so on. And sources obtained from documents, such as various organizational records, journals, discussion on online forums and social media, video footage, etc. As such, case studies are not inherently qualitative or quantitative in nature. They often combine several data sources and sometimes make use of both qualitative and quantitative approaches. That being said, most case studies that I have encountered did make use of qualitative data. A case study based purely on quantitative data is not the most common research design. So let's say you would like to design a case study. An important place to start after considering your research problem and a question or a hypothesis is to define your case. Is your case an individual person, such as a teacher or learner? This might be easier to work with due to the smaller scope, but it may also be criticized by some because of being too narrow, 
especially if we cannot justify this narrowness by providing a very deep and insightful analysis of the case. Or maybe your case is a single event, such as a school fair, or an exam, or a hackathon. This can be good for capturing the dynamics in a single brief context, but it will not give you much insight into longer-term processes that may have affected the outcomes. Your case could also be a single course or a project, allowing for a longer-term analysis of how a particular activity evolves over time. Or you could be examining an entire group or organization, such as a public school, over a period of time, which will provide a broader, meso-level perspective, potentially at the expense of depth. As you see, the choice of a case involves some trade-offs, and while any of these options can work, it is important to consider what kind of case would suit your research objectives the best. For example, if your case study is about interpersonal relationships in the classroom, it makes sense to consider focusing on a particular group of students or a specific course rather than the entire school. Once you have decided on the type of case, it's time to choose a specific case you would like to focus on. Choosing a case works very differently from sampling from a population in an experimental study or survey. In these other approaches, it is standard practice to construct a large enough sample by recruiting participants at random so that they represent a broader population. In a case study, choosing your subjects randomly is not the best idea. This is because you're focusing on a subset that is just too small to be fully representative of the overall population, and it will have its own biases. And if it is going to have biases, it is better if you as a researcher are aware of what they are and choose them in a meaningful way. You might still want to select a typical case, that is to say, a case that shares many features with what is currently known about the overall population. Let us say you're doing a case study on digital technology use in Estonian libraries. A typical case for this would probably be a medium-sized library in a medium-sized Estonian town. Not too big, not too small, not too popular, not nearly disused, not overly advanced, and not terribly lagging behind. On the other hand, you might want to focus on the outliers, cases that would be on the fringes of the normal distribution curve if you were doing a survey. Examining these outliers more closely may reveal more useful insights into the phenomenon being studied than just looking at the typical cases. For example, you might focus on a particularly influential case. If you are studying technology used in Estonian libraries, this could be the National Library of Estonia, which has recently worked to acquire a video game collection. Or this might be a more obscure case, such as the library on the island of Pirisar in Lake Papus, where the permanent population is estimated to be between 30 and 60 people, most of them elderly and speaking Russian, not Estonian, as their first language. Is digitization taking place in that remote corner of the nation? Quite possibly, but it will likely take a different form and face different challenges than, say, in Tallinn. Another approach to choosing a case study is focusing on what are called deviant cases. These are exceptions to the rules, cases that in some way defy established understanding or go against current theories, and the goal with these will often be to establish why this happens and what it says about the rule of theory in question. In the library example, maybe your deviant case could be Katarina Ye the bookmobile associated with Tallinn Central Library, effectively a bus with books that travels around the city of Tallinn. Bookmobiles have actually existed since the 19th century, but in contemporary Estonia this is a fairly recent phenomenon, and Estonia only has one, making this a unique case that challenges the assumption that the library must be a static place. Before I wrap up this overview, I would like to raise three further considerations regarding case study research. One criticism that you may come across is that case studies are quote-unquote subjective in nature and idiosyncratic in that they reflect both the assumptions of the researcher and the biases inherent in the case. I do not dispute this claim, but I would argue against the idea that it is possible to eliminate subjectivity from any social sciences research. Experimental studies and surveys might seem to be more objective because they provide you with measurable data and cover a larger population, 
but they are also based on the researcher's subjective choices. This is exactly why, after 30 years of studying whether playing video games causes violence in players, we still have researchers arguing over the seemingly basic question. Some large-scale surveys say yes, many others say no. That's because different scholars define violence differently, measure it differently, and structure their questionnaires and tests in ways that may nudge people to do or say slightly different things. So it is nearly impossible to eliminate bias from a research design anyway, but what a researcher can do, and what is really important for a case study, given its small-scale nature, is that the researcher be aware of what biases they have, and what biases their case has, and what effects just them being there and conducting research may have on their respondents. It is, in other words, crucial to be reflexive throughout the process of designing your case study, conducting it, and analyzing the results. Another criticism that case studies are often faced with has to do with their perceived lack of generalizability. Indeed, unlike a survey, a case study alone could not be a basis for making generalizations about an entire population. But that is not a case study's job. By selecting your cases strategically, what you can do is provide insights that are missing from broader generalizations. You can also rely on what Robert Heen calls analytical generalization to ground your results in and connect them to other existing studies, whether it be case studies, surveys, or anything else, as well to existing theories. The job of a case study, therefore, is not to provide broad population-level generalizations, but to refine existing theories, analyze the reasons behind people's actions, and add more detail to the big picture. Finally, by focusing on a small and potentially identifiable case, case studies may raise a host of ethical considerations. We will discuss these in more detail later in the course, but for now let me just mention that maintaining your study participants' anonymity is one such consideration. Discussing your subject at length makes them easier to identify, which may violate their privacy and is particularly problematic in studies with children and vulnerable social groups such as minorities or people with a disability. A related consideration is what implications publishing your results may have on your study participants. Might describing a case where a teacher is struggling to follow the curriculum lead to the teacher getting in trouble with the school administration, or perhaps to the school being punished by the local government? Are you ready to take part of the responsibility for this happening? These are the kind of repercussions that a researcher should consider when designing and writing up their study, and I hope we can discuss them further later in the course. For now, thank you for watching, and I hope this has given you some idea about how case studies work.